I want to talk about uh, one thing to sort of uh, lay the, the groundwork here. Uh, the next several slides actually come from a presentation from uh, someone from the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, who has uh, talked about natural capitalism. And uh, so natural capitalism, the, uh, capitalism, what is it? The productive use and reinvestment of capital. There's several kinds of capital. There's financial capital, obviously. There's goods, the infrastructure that we have that, that uh, enables the economy to function. We have human capital which is really important. We have nature. The natural capital is really the, the foundation of everything in our economy. Without ecosystem services that provide uh, for us, we don't have anything, right? So if we can't feed ourselves, uh, we'll be in uh, lots and lots of trouble. So uh, the first industrial revolution was uh, based on the tenet that people are scarce and resources are abundant, and so the way to become uh, better was to improve labor productivity. So the focus was on uh, the Industrial Revolution helping people become more productive. We saw a hundredfold increase in productivity. Uh, uh, quite incredible. Today, we're in a little bit different uh, situation where people are abundant and resources are scarce. And so this points us in the direction of the next uh, uh, and I'm not sure industrial revolution is the right uh, phrase, but the next revolution in which uh, we need to increase resource productivity because we have uh, ample, ample label, labor. <clears throat> so in the future, we're limited by how much fish, not how many boats. And this is really important because it, le it leads us to uh, what can we achieve? How can we move forward from today and increase our resource use efficiency? What is it that we'll need to do? And I would submit to you that <coughs> traceability and sustainability are both key in that equation. <coughs> With respect to aquaculture in particular, uh, global uh, aquatic life, aquatic livestock consumption is increasing. We lose uh, uh, waste. We have waste. We also have uh, pressures, significant pressures on wild stocks. Lots of fisheries are um, overfished and many others are at capacity. Uh, and one statistic suggests that up to uh, one in ten people get their livelihood from fisheries or aquaculture uh, globally. Obviously not in the, in the United States yet. <coughs> We hope that uh, right over the over time that will improve, but so far uh, it's not. So m my tenet here is that without appropriate metrics and measures, we will find it increasingly difficult to achieve sustainable production and consumption across all of agriculture, not not just in aquaculture. And uh, achieving this requires collection of and access to high quality information uh, that's transparent. Uh, uh, regarding material and energy flows through the system. So including um, all of the uh, energy and materials associated from the extraction of raw materials all the way to the disposal of packaging. Uh, and at some point, providing this information, as we heard in some of the talks this morning with the demands from consumers for increased transparency and understanding of the sources of their food, uh, this may ultimately become part of the social license to operate. And so I think uh, it's quite important. Sustainability, of course, is a, a almost now a hackneyed term. Uh, what does it mean? For me, I, I think it, it's simple, living within our means. We need, therefore, because of the uh, resource demands and the declining resource availability, we have to focus on resource use efficiency. A, uh, uh, an equally important piece of it is, I suppose, if we live within our means, that will also ensure that future generations have the opportunity to live within their means. So this is sort of a uh, uh, paraphrasing of the Brundtland Commission uh, definition of sustainability. So given the recognition that resources are uh, limiting, uh, we need to have, as I've already mentioned, measures and metrics. Otherwise, we risk failing the future generations. We have to be able to document and track our progress across whole supply chains. 
us provides, as I've said, both the rationale for the license to operate as well as uh, an ability to begin managing risk because as, as resources become more and more scarce, we have to understand what alternative supply chains may exist in order to provide those uh, same goods and services. And so uh, <clears throat> I will talk to you a little bit about life cycle assessment and uh, try to articulate how it provides a framework for capturing and interpreting the measures and metrics and that LCA in the end, although not today, in the end, I think it will uh, heavily rely on traceability. And so trying to tie uh, sustainability and traceability concepts uh, together. So um, I don't know if I, if, if, please, again, don't hesitate to interrupt or uh, articulate a different view because mine's not the only one. So the next several slides, uh, and, and that ends, well, the last two slides uh, weren't from uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, but the natural capitalism stuff uh, was from RMI. Uh, so <clears throat> because LCA provides a framework, I want to give you a, a, an overview of life cycle assessment and then give a couple of uh, uh, case studies uh, that we've looked at. So life cycle assessment is a, uh, really an accounting framework, if you will to quantify the inputs and outputs of a system across an entire supply chain <coughs> connected to uh, what we call a functional unit. So the functional unit in a food system might be a kilogram of milk or a kilogram of uh, tilapia, <coughs> a kilogram of shrimp. And the, uh, the, the system is, is designed so that we keep track of what we call reference flows. So in order to provide a, a fillet of salmon, for example, uh, you might have to have produced, so, so it's a, say a one kilogram uh, fillet of salmon, you might at the farm gate have uh, had to have something like 1.2 or 1.3 kilograms of salmon live weight because of the losses along the way. So we keep track of all of those things in a life cycle assessment, tying it to this functional unit. The uh, International Standard for Organization, or Organization for Standardization, uh, has a series of standards that govern the uh, application of life cycle assessment, which begins with uh, the goal and scope. The, the multiple arrows and inter interlocking uh, lines are to indicate the iterative nature of LCA. So we start with a goal and scope definition, which as with every project that we always do, it's critical that we understand why we're doing it. So who, are, who is the audience? How will they use the information? What do we need to provide to them? Uh, the inventory, uh, capturing the material flows and uh, energy flows. Uh, impact assessment, so we'll collapse all of the uh, flows into impact assessment, such as the carbon footprint, which I think probably everyone is, is familiar with. And then we look at the interpretation. So what does it mean? Where are the hot spots? Can we identify inefficiencies in the supply chain that are causing uh, uh, excess environmental impacts? Some of the things that LCA is used for, product development, <coughs> benchmarking, uh, uh, product labeling uh, can be used. Uh, I know that the, the US uh, Soybean Board uh, Export Council has been in conversations with the folks in the EU about exporting US soybeans. And among the things that were in the conversation were how sustainably produced are US soybeans. And uh, of course, the Europeans are concerned about uh, uh, GMOs uh, and other things. And so through those conversations, we were able to show them that, in fact, US soybeans are, are quite competitive on a sustainability metric. And so uh, it, it has uh, importance in the context of opening markets as well. Uh, <clears throat> it's a multi-step process. We calculate over the entire life time of a good or service. Uh, what are the environmental impacts? Again, based on the functional unit, it's necessary to define the system boundaries. Quite often there will be uh, what we call cradle to gate. So uh, looking at the, the initial extraction of raw materials all the way to the production of, uh, for example, a kilogram of tilapia at the, at the aquaculture gate. Uh, the other system boundary that's commonly used is cradle to grave, and so that would go cradle to gate, and then it would go through all of the uh, processing, manufacturing, distribution, retail, cooking, disposal, packaging, everything that you can imagine that's connected to the supply chain to provide that functional unit. So all of those things are accounted 
uh, at the at the full system. <clears throat> so to do that, we collect uh, data uh, mapped along the supply chain, and the, the connection with traceability, I hope, is fairly obvious here. Because if we understand how things are moving through the supply chain, we can also begin to better track the uh, energy and emissions and uh, transportation, everything that's associated with getting that product to uh, the consumer. Uh, so all of the resource flows are accounted. We have human and natural inputs through the agriculture and urban systems. So this would be the wastewater treatment facilities, for example, that uh, have to be accounted because as we eat, we excrete, and that uh, material can't be just uh, disposed without processing, so all of that is accounted in a full life cycle assessment. Uh, and then the last step, uh, not the last step, the next step is the life cycle impact assessment. And so we would, uh, for example, in, a, in an agricultural system for, for example, crawfish production, we would account for the methane emissions associated with the anaerobic uh, ponds that the, those animals are, are grown in, and we'll come back to that in one of the case examples. So those emissions would be accounted, and methane has a different global warming potential than carbon dioxide, and so how do we, how do we communicate that? Well, we add it all together into what's known as the, the carbon footprint, and I've got a slide that will uh, explain that a little bit more. <clears throat> so as I said, LCA is an accounting uh, uh, framework, and well, almost everything we do has more than one function. Um, so uh, as, as fish uh, are produced or as shrimp uh, are harvested and the, the shells and the meat are separated, uh, what happens to the co-product? What happens to the byproduct? And so we try to make a full accounting of that. And there's two uh, accounting schemes, if you will. One says, let's look at the supply chain, the physical connections. This is uh, sort of the engineering perspective. And then let's say, okay, at the, uh, at the, at the point in the supply chain where the uh, shells are removed from the shrimp, uh, we've created two useful products. One is more useful than the other, of course, but uh, then we have to decide of all of the things that happened prior to that point, how much of the greenhouse gas emissions up to that point go with the shells and how much go with the meat. We could say, well, all of it goes with the meat, okay, so the shells go off and something happens to them, or we could say, well, there's actually value there, and so some of the burden associated with producing that product also should go with that. And we just make a, uh, uh, frankly, uh, can be arbitrary, right? So we use a mass basis. We use an economic basis. We could use a protein content basis. This is one of the criticisms of this attributional approach is that it's a normative separation of these emissions. As an accounting practice, well, it's okay. It's just we agree that this is how we're going to do it. The alternative approach is to say that the, uh, uh, the shells may go into the Kaidasan market and therefore they have some value, but they in that market have displaced something else. And so from the economic perspective in the larger economy, we ask what was displaced? That thing was then not needed. We didn't need to produce it. And so we take a credit. So we subtract the credit. We subtract the emissions that would have occurred if the other thing didn't exist. Uh, and then we have a reduction in the impact of the, the shrimp meat. <clears throat> LCA is built on unit processes. Uh, so we, what, what's bought, what's sold, what did we extract from nature? So if it's a trawler, the fish was extracted from nature. If it's a, a processing facility, it might be water from a well. If it's a mining facility, it's the coal or whatever. Uh, what kinds of emissions? Greenhouse gases, particulates, ammonia, Take your pick of a long list of things that can be emitted. And in terms of the traceability uh, language, this is where key data elements can be captured. And we can understand then at each stage in the supply chain, what are the important things vis-a-vis -vis, uh, both the, the, the tracing of the, the animal product through the system, but also if we add the data requirements to the uh, to the system, whether it's a relational database or a blockchain system or uh, some other sort of a ledger, we can keep track of it. And if it then becomes available, we can use it uh, in the assessment of the environmental uh, sustainability characteristics. These uh, systems are linked together. 
Uh, and each of these uh, black arrows would, of course, represent a uh, critical tracking event in a traceability scenario, and we'd keep track of all of this, and we'd build it together into a, uh, a system of data that we can uh, analyze later and use for <coughs> life cycle assessment. So uh, in terms of impact assessment, I mentioned that uh, you know we've got, oh, I think the IPCC has 100 or so greenhouse gases, and they all have different characteristics, but we don't want to talk about them. We want to look at uh, the, the global warming potential. And so the, uh, the lens of life cycle impact assessment takes this long list of chemicals uh, and collapses it into a relatively small list of other chemicals. In uh, some of the methods that are available, we have uh, pretty high uh, confidence in the individual life cycle impact results, right? We've, we've measured how much energy was used at that facility. And so we have high level of confidence in things on this side. And then we see how those things affect the things that we care about. Uh, ozone layer, photochemical oxidation, etc. These can be combined into a smaller set of things. It's a lot easier to get our heads around. And as we do that, we see that while we have higher confidence here, we have a better ability to make decisions on the on the right hand side. And so we talk about a, the the product having a certain uh, human health impact or human a certain ecosystem services impact. Uh, when we begin to get out here, we start to be able to get to the point where we can actually have uh, education opportunities and communication with consumers, right? One of the things that was mentioned in the morning sessions was we really need to educate people about agriculture. And if we, you know, if we're, if we're way back here in the, in the weeds with so many things happening, you know, how many, uh, what, 700,000 beef uh, farms in the U.S.? And I'll bet uh, 699,000 of them have different management systems, right? So how do we, <laughs> how do we, uh, how do we, how do we, how do we do that? And so life cycle assessment is a, is a mechanism by which we can collapse these things, sort of integrate across supply chains and across management practices and articulate and communicate uh, to consumers. So here's a sort of a typical uh, network diagram from one of the studies that we do. What we learn quickly is that some things matter more than others and that we need to really focus on those. But uh, as I was looking at this again, um, <clears throat> I, I'm, tr I'm trying to imagine exactly how traceability <laughs> you know, fits in, right? It, it, the, none of these things that we're talking about are, are going to be simple. Um, but by adding the traceability that we've been talking about today into our supply chains, I think that the, uh, a really significant added value of that can be better understanding of the environmental sustainability because we can begin to pull that information into a network like this and, and uh, use the software tools that we have to understand it. So the life cycle perspective, think broadly. <clears throat> Entire supply chains, full systems. Think deeply. What are the impacts? What are the endpoints? What are the things that matter? How can we affect them? We think quanti quantitatively. How much of this is required to produce that? Let's think about what if we make changes? How can we affect changes? Well, will they be beneficial or will they be harmful? Document uh, with standard approaches and keep the data transparent. So I want to do a quick comparison of uh, uh, aquaponics and recirculating systems. Uh, simple supply diagram. <clears throat> we've got farms. We've got wild caught. Right, so we've got uh, options in the supply chain. We'll focus primarily on, on this one. In the goal and scope, we wanted to produce uh, 0.4 kilograms of tilapia and 6 tenths of a kilogram of lettuce using an aquaponic system and then using two separate systems, a, a, a hydroponic and an aquaculture system. So I'm sure that all of you are, are familiar enough with what these systems look like, so I'll go through these fairly quickly. Uh, so these are the, the, the two separate ones, and then here's the combined aquaponic system where the, the fish and the uh, vegetables are grown together. And what do you expect the results to be in terms of the environmental impacts of the systems. Now, let me, let me back up and say both scenarios 
We have scenario A, which is an aquaculture system and a hydroponic system operated separately. And we have an aquaponic system where they're combined. Both produce the same thing, right? We, we scale it so that we have 0.4 kilograms of tilapia and 600 grams of lettuce. What do you expect? Which one will be the more uh, efficient or the less uh, environmentally impactful? Combined. The combined. Generally, if we can combine things, right, m multi-output systems are generally more efficient. And in fact, in this case, it's about almost across the board 32 to 35 percent less impactful uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the things that we measured in this particular study, water, greenhouse gas, and energy. And so using this framework, we can understand how different systems compare, right? We, we've produced the same functional unit, right? We've got the same uh, products to send to the consumer, but at less environmental cost. And in fact, uh, uh, more economically uh, efficient as well. I, didn't, I don't have those slides here. Uh, <clears throat> the major uh, GHGs are associated with electricity use for pumps and fans. The aquaponics uses less. There's also a little bit less transport. Both systems use, uh, not surprisingly, a fair amount of water, and the results from energy are driven by the same factors that drive uh, global warming. So we have four uh, mainland systems. Again, quick, uh, quick run through this. One kilogram of uh, live weight of fish at the farm gate, looking at these four uh, species and comparing these uh, impacts. So I won't spend really any time uh, other than to say that we, we built models, if you will, of these things or collected data on the production uh, uh, from those uh, four systems. And uh, I've sort of already alluded to this. The crawfish have a carbon footprint that is as high as beef, which is frankly shocking to me. Methane from, so crawfish, at least in this study, they, they're grown in a, uh, uh, basically a rice field. Uh, and so depending, and so if you have a multifunctional system where you harvest the rice and sell it, then it will go down from this. But if the rice is grown simply as feed for the crawfish, which is one of the ways that it's done, then all of the methane associated with the anaerobic nature of the flooded rice goes to the crawfish. So it's, uh, when I first thought, saw that, I, I was like, wow, this is, uh, <laughs> this is not what I expected. Uh, but the, other, the others uh, are, not significantly different, if you will, from, from other animal proteins, milk or uh, uh, poultry or pigs are, are in, this, in this same range. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up in the next couple of slides. I want to touch back on natural capitalism, sustainability, and, and, and traceability. We know that resources are becoming uh, limiting, and we must be uh, cognizant of that and improve our uh, food production systems. How do we do that? By understanding and documenting supply chain interactions and transactions from extraction to disposal. And uh, we can use those uh, to the tools, uh, traceability uh, data and life cycle assessment to identify environmental hotspots. And I mean, obviously, food safety is a critical uh, point, both for sustainability, right? It's not, uh, if we account for human health effects of the food that we eat, foodborne disease is a significant contributor to the, to the adverse human health effects. And so uh, from my perspective, uh, the, the mitigation of foodborne disease is a significant sustainability uh, benefit. It's not well captured in the LCA framework uh, yet, but um, LCA is a, a, good, a good tool for doing this, but does require a lot of information, and thus the traceability efforts, I think, are quite uh, relevant and important for uh, moving that forward. Uh, the, the, the ability to, to really uh, use LCA as a tool for specific supply chain uh, management. And then I'll close with this slide again. Uh, uh, if all you take away from this is this slide, that's enough. Uh, systems thinking is what we need. 
Um, and whether we use one tool or another, if we, if we fall into the trap of, of siloed optimization, we'll end up with uh, a system as a whole that's not optimized. It may be better to run one piece of the system suboptimally so that the entire system can be more, uh, more functional. So we need to, to think, think broadly. We need to think deeply, quantitatively, and comparatively, and we need to, to continually document uh, the data following standards uh, and keep it as transparent as possible, uh, as opaque as necessary. Right, so we're not going to, I'm not advocating that everybody give out their uh, proprietary business information. Um, it's not necessary. Uh, but some information, I think, in order for us to, to move whole systems forward, some information uh, transparency is necessary. And traceability is, a, is an excellent tool that provides, I think, strong synergy with um, sustainability and sustainability efforts. And with that, I'll close and take any questions.